Welcome back to Division One Rejects. Like always, I'm your host, Kobe Manso, back at it for D1R 184. On the night of November 11th, we've got one more week until we are talking about real playoff football. That is a reality. And tonight, we've got updated Division Two football regional rankings concerning playoff bids. The 28 teams from four different super regions that will ultimately make it into the national dance at the D2 level. We also have every Division Three team thus far that has clinched playoff berths with automatic qualifiers and, uh, excuse me, conference championships. So definitely tune in for those. But joining me tonight, a man at the head of D3 football right now, Zach Boys, the quarterback out of Cortland up there in upstate New York, the reigning, defending, national champion, MVP of that game. Zach Boys, friend of the show, is back. Excited to have him. But also joining us later on, Kenton Allen, the linebacker from Angelo State, some Lone Star Conference representation from the Lone Star State. The Rams picked up a big-time win and clinched the Lone Star Conference title this last week. Excited to talk to him. He has been a monster this past year, looking at his impact defensively for that squad down there. So a lot of really good things going on. Jimmy Martin will be back to talk about Division Three football. No Matt Schwarzler tonight, but we still will have some NAIA coverage towards the end of the show. Like always, if you watch this episode on YouTube, don't forget the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of the show that sounds remotely interesting. Those are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. And uh, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm repping the the you know the traditional D1R merch right now, or one show that is, or one shirt, excuse me, that is uh, released and out on the storefront. But uh, I did just order some mock-ups of a second design. I promised once we got the 10K followers, I would be dropping another T-shirt. I'm really excited about this one for the uh, the small school products. To give you a hint, right there, um, I want to make sure everything is the quality is is up to par and everything before I uh, really send that out and start distributing that to you guys and make that available. But uh, Definitely be on the lookout in the coming days, potentially the coming week here, and I'm hopefully going to be making an announcement about some new merch and a new way for you guys to support the show and rep uh, the small school products. So uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. I got a uh, a fun tweet of the week here. I'm trying to make this a weekly thing. It's something that I, I find interesting maybe that I'll, that I'll pull up and talk about on a weekly basis on, during the episode. This one comes from Southern Arkansas football, Mule Rider football, if you will. And they say... How does the number 10 team in Super Region 3 last week enter this week at 8-2, win Saturday 78-0, have a better record than the new 7, 8, and 9 teams, play in the same conference and schedule as number 5 and 6, who stayed the same, but dropped out? That's a long way of saying, we did everything that we could and we got penalized. And... (laughs) The gif that accompanies it is hilarious. And uh, Mule Rider Football, I am right with you. I am right with you. And, and the way that the D2, those rankings are being determined, some of the criteria is being changed, in, uh, introduction of the KPI and the more maybe heavily leaning into that metric of uh, you know with some other metrics kind of put in there and how heavily those are each weighted. That is a great question. And I wish there was a lot more. If nothing else, I'm not going to come on here and bash the system tonight. I've done that enough. If nothing else, I was I wish there was more transparency. And we could hear from some of these people that are, you know, on set committee or, or hear from some of these decision makers. I think that would be very beneficial for all parties. Because I think it's funny when, when people assume wrongly that I or the guys at D2Football.com have a say in what that goes on. Now, D2Football.com, they got their own top 25 ranking they do a great job with, but they are not in control of of this, right? So I think some more transparency there would definitely be much appreciated. But uh, nonetheless, let's get into the episode. we got a great conversation coming up with the quarterback of the Red Dragons. That's Zach Boys. Join the show tonight. You know him from the 2023 National Championship squad, the quarterback of the Cortland Red Dragons. Friend of the show, it's Zach Boys. What's going on, yes, fella? Sir. Going on, man. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you again. Excited to be back on, dude. Thanks excited to get you back on here. And like I was kind of telling you before we got going, uh, we could have talked to you at any point throughout this season. You've been putting up ridiculous numbers. You guys have been on a tear. But I like to talk to you guys after you go through kind of what was the ringer this weekend. And I'm I'm excited to to talk about that and the Brockport squad that I mean gave you guys everything you could handle for that Empire Eight crown. Even though there's a decent chance that even with a, a loss there. You know, hypothetically speaking, that you guys could be a shoo-in for a playoff. It probably felt more like a must-win on your side, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to get in the tournament is to win your conference. You know, then there's no, you don't got to worry about, like, this year it's math. You know, last year it was, you know, whatever it was. And mm-hmm. so, you know, just to get, it's it's like a relief. You know, that's that's our first goal is to get to the NCAA tournament. And then, you know, as you saw last year, you just got to get in and, and get hot at the right time. So, um, 
definitely a relief to, to, to punch our ticket. I believe that, dude. Now you come off of that um, from one emotional big win to what could be another this weekend. The Korakaja game is one that um, at least I have seen very minimal about because obviously the focus from you guys, you do it right. You do it the one game at a time. Let's finish out our in-conference play. But then it's not like you just have some game out of conference to go close out the season. We're talking about one of the biggest rivalries at this level. I mean, how do you get the guys to go from having this big comeback victory where we'll talk about you never led basically throughout the entirety of the game uh, yeah. to come from that high of highs to try and maintain that and keep the guys locked in for this week, man. Korakaja. Well, I think, you know, a lot of the reason why you come to Cortland is to play in this game. Um, you know, it's a big selling point for, you know, Coach Fitz talks about it, you know, all the time. And um, you, there's there's not much that you have to say to get everybody riled up. You know, we know how big of a game it is. Um, the campus stuff that knows how big of a game it is. You know, it's everybody's – it's a different feeling of quarter week. You know, walking around, everybody's a um, little bit more fired up, a little bit – um, you know, being at our place this year, everybody's a little, you know, ready to kind of host, host a Cortica jug. So, Hell yeah. um, you know, it's not really anything you have to say. It's more of controlling those emotions and, you know, keeping everybody in check and not getting too high or too low. Um, because that's what this game is. It's an emotional roller coaster, And, you know, the team that's kind of even keeled throughout the whole game is who, who ends up coming up, a, coming up on top. So, yeah. um, the biggest thing is just kind of controlling all those emotions and, and all the outside noise and just, you know, focusing in, in, on the job at hand. You know, it's a party for everybody else, but it's a business for us, business trip for us. So um, that's good. I like you know, that. I like that. So. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. That's well said. And, and staying on that on that same vein, this weekend, Brockport, 14 nothing. You guys are on the, the bad end of a deficit, the likes of which you really have not seen this year, right? And you talk about a squad that hasn't experienced much of that. Now, a lot of these guys come back from playing in a ton of competitive games and a lot of great postseason stuff last year, but what was the reaction from the guys immediately on the sideline right there, down 14 nothing, two scores, and, and needing to bounce right back? Yeah, you know, we were in a similar situation versus Susquehanna where we kind of yep. we went down 14 nothing again, and, um, you know, it's just kind of like it was so early in the game where it was like we knew there was so much time left to, mm -hmm. to kind of get on the right side of things. Um, it ended up taking us a little bit, but, you know, we ended up there. But, um, you know, they scored on their first drive. We had a good first drive going, just hurt ourselves with some penalties, and then obviously the block punt for, for a touchdown. Um, yeah. I think after that, we just needed to settle down, just get into the flow of the game, you know, understand that, again, there's a ton of time left. And, you know, honestly, in that game early, we just hurt ourselves on offense with way too many penalties. You know, we were moving the ball well. We were doing a lot of good things. We just didn't, um, you know, we got behind the sticks on third down, and, Brockport's the number one scoring defense in the country for a reason. You know, yep. you don't want to be there that long against them. You know, they do a ton of exotic stuff, and they got a really, really good defensive line um, that just doesn't give you a lot of time to sit back there and and survey the defense. So, we just kind of had to get our, get in get our footing in the game, and you know, let our defense settle down, settle into the game, and and do what they do. Um, yep. So obviously, you don't want to get down fourteen nothing, but you know, we there was no finger pointing or heads down. It was just kind of all right. We got. We got to do it the hard way. You know, we can't do it the pretty way anymore. And um, like I said, we, we did that against Susquehanna. And um, it's it's awesome to see that we have that resiliency. But obviously, we don't want to yeah. in that situation again and, and have to have to pull one out that way. But, it's um, good to, yeah, come out of a lesson like that with a W, too, and, and be able to learn from that and also get the result that you want. And you personally had a hell of a streak going. I didn't know this, and I'm, I'm not sure if you did. 291 passes without throwing one to the defense my friend and of course that comes to an end this weekend it is better than five interceptions with the quarterback uh i did see this weekend did that i don't know if you tuned into that sunday night game oh, yeah. crazy game dude crazy game. That was crazy yeah Terrible but uh that that streak of yours was that even something you're conscious of or, or aware of during that game um no <laughs> you know i i mean i'd be lying if i said i didn't know about it but um yeah you know that i had a lot of luck this year with that with that uh that, with that streak um do some passes that should have been intercepted. And also I got great receivers that make a ton of great plays. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was pretty cool to see that I haven't turned the ball over. Um, you know, that's something I pride myself on because absolutely all the program, you want to protect the ball at all, at all costs and win the turnover battle. Um, but again, it's been a lot of luck, a lot of bad throws that, you know, the defense just, they were so bad that they couldn't even catch them. So, you know, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit lucky good. sometimes. Um, but that's just how, that's just how football rolls and yeah. it shakes out. Um, but yeah, I've been really proud of the offense and just, taking care of the ball this year. You know, we don't have many turnovers, which is really good. And, you know, kind of our, one of our main goals is to just to protect the ball. So we've been doing a good job of it all year. And, you know, we just got to kind of keep, keep, keep doing that. 
Yeah, and I'd imagine, you know, I was going to ask about where you've seen growth in yourself from a year ago to now, and I'm imagining taking care of the ball is one of those things. Um, five interceptions a year ago is not a bad number at all, but you've seemingly one up yourself, and knock on wood, you hopefully got a lot of ball to play yet. But coming out of last year, a lot of people on the outside, you see this Cortland team, and you lose your top two pass catchers, and you expect maybe this stark drop-off in production, and we have seen anything but that. What do you attribute that to, and, and where have you made strides personally? And I'm sure you'll deflect to some of your teammates, but talk about yourself a little bit there and, and what you've worked on and what you take pride in there yeah i think um like you said we lost two of our, our two top guys to the nfl which is which was pretty cool but hell yeah um, you know it's yeah i think it just took it's, it just took some time for all of us to kind of get on the same page um you know all of our receivers have only played in uh you know single digit games and started single digit games at receiver for us right now um you know Jaden's played a ton of football but he's played a ton of football at running back you know if not a ton of receiver and I don't think people understand how hard it is to make a jump from running back to receiver. You know, it's not just like you can just go out there and, and be great at that like he is. Um, there's a ton of detail that goes into our offense and, you know, a ton of timing things and, and choice routes and stuff that we do that just takes some time to get on the same page. So I think I've just been really impressed with how, how fast we've kind of picked it up and, and you know, been able to, to move the ball as an offense. Um, you know, I just... Being accurate with the ball and be, protecting the ball is something that I really, really pride myself on and letting our guys make plays. You know, we got guys that are dynamic with the ball in space. So, you know, just get them the ball, let them do all the cool stuff, and I can just sit back there and watch and be a spectator, you know. I like um, that. But, you know, a real testament goes off to our offensive line. You know, they're they're the core of our offense. Um, we have a really good group in a, in, a, in a tough group that, you know, it allows us to establish the running game but also gives me a ton of time back there to make plays. Um, I was talking about Brockport's D-line this weekend. But, you know, they didn't make um, so many plays for us where it was, you know, they didn't have that big of an impact on the game where, you know, they were ruining everything we did. Yep. Um, our line played very well. And, you know, like I said, it's just, it's a huge testament to what they do. And, and they're the core of what our offense is built on. So it's just pretty cool to see how far they've grown as well this season. Um, yeah, and you talk about, I mean, those yeah, last two seasons, up. amount of success you guys have had. What's the the difference, if you had to pick something out that stands out, maybe whether it's personnel, play style, something else that, that kind of jumps out about this team, how would you describe the difference between uh, last year's squad to here, not saying in terms of better, worse, or indifferent, but just the way you guys go out there and play on Saturdays? Yeah, I think we're a little bit more gritty than we were last year. Um, you know, we, we, we're an older veteran group. Um, you know, we definitely are can run the ball a little bit better than we oh, yeah. were in years past. And, um, you know, our defense is playing really, really good football right now when we put them in good situations and, and allow them to kind of make plays. Um, so I think we are a little bit grittier. We're older. I think it's just more experience, you know, where we played a ton of football, us seniors, where we've been up and we've been, you know, winning a lot of games by a lot of points. And, um, you know, last year just kind of playing in those competitive games taught us how to win in the hard. You know, that's a saying that Coach Mack, the coach before uh, Coach Fitz, um, used to say all the time and kind of carried over from his culture, you know, just winning in the hard, doing whatever it takes to, to get a win on, on Saturdays and doing the hard things well. Um, I think we, you know, adapted that and, and have done a good job of that so far this year. But, um, you know, we got to continue to raise the bar and, and just start out faster and not let ourselves get behind, um, you know, and just play better at the start of games, you know, not be afraid to lose. Just go out there and let it rip and, and do what we do. Yeah, you definitely, I mean, when you're playing your best ball, it's it's comfortable and it's loose and you guys are confident as hell, man. Watching the offense come together is certainly a fun deal. But uh, 29 points, not necessarily the, the biggest output you guys have had this year. But you look at the box score and you look deeper and actually look at some of the game, almost 600 yards of total offense. And while that maybe doesn't translate over to the to the scoreboard in this instance, you still get the result that you needed. And I imagine there's still a lot of really good offensive takeaways from that unit coming out of this weekend, a lot to build off of. Yeah, a ton, a ton. You know, 590 yards are a lot of yards for mm -hmm. only 29 points, you know. and But it's also a testament to that Brockport defense where they they played a bended but don't break. Um, we didn't play well in the red zone. We didn't execute like we normally do. Um, we've been a great red zone offense all year. Um but we just kind of, you know, left a lot of meat on the bone um, in the red zone. So I think it was, you know, we, we moved the ball well. We did a lot of good things. But, again, we hurt ourselves early and got ourselves in a lot of third and longs. And then when we are in the red zone, we just didn't, didn't execute. So, you know, third down in red zone are where you get your points on a, at, from the offensive side of the ball. And, um, you know, we weren't great in those areas. And that's why we didn't, you know, put up as many points as we should have. Um, but, you know, like I said, 590 yards, you know, if you would have told me that before the game, I would have. Right. I would have been beating for it against that defense. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's just the way it shakes out. And, you know, we just got to be better situationally and 
um, I think we will be, you know, as, as the season rolls on. Absolutely. Yeah. And you talk about a test like that right before, hopefully ramping up for a, for a playoff run for you guys. But again, taking care of business this weekend, I'll definitely be tuned in my friend. I appreciate you coming back on. Well said as always, dude, you get, you get better with, uh, with every appearance you're starting to, you're going to be a pro here. Hey man, I'm just getting old. That's all it is. Getting old. <laughs> getting old. Shout out coach Fitz. He trains me. I love it. Thank you very much, Zach. Have a good rest of your night, dude. Yeah, man. Thanks for all you do again. You're the man. Big thank you to Zach for joining us. Now to move over to D2 football. We've got updated regional rankings for the D2 football playoff. And, guys, this is where it gets really interesting. All right. Super region number one. A lot of this maybe has not changed as much as, uh, you know, some of the other super regions. Charleston, Kutztown still on top. And and this super region may as well be called the, the PSAC Invitational because you got Kutztown, Cal PA, Slippery Rock, East Stroudsburg all in the mix right there. Uh, all top six teams in the region, so all guaranteed a spot in the playoff. Now, New Haven in at number seven spot. Ashland does drop out after a tough loss to Walsh this week, so a little bit of a shakeup there. Finley... Coming in at number five, they've got a big time matchup against Tiffin this coming weekend, so we'll see how that determines. You know, the result of that could have some consequences potentially here. You've got Assumption and Bentley, a couple of NA, NA ten teams, excuse me, on the outside looking in. And in this case, we were talking about New Haven last week and in, in the super region rankings, and I think it was worth noting. I talked about the earned access, the quote unquote earned access rule that's being implemented in Division Two when it comes to playoff seating. And I didn't have a great understanding of what that was last week. I did a little bit of research and. Earned access means that if a conference is not represented in the super region, that if that team is in the top nine as opposed to the top seven, they would take the seventh seed's spot. So if as we go down the list, we I think there's a there's an example of this um, as we continue to to go down. It wouldn't be there, but I believe Super Region 3, we're going to bounce back and forth a little bit. I apologize. But in Super Region 3, for example, you have UND as the lone GLVC representative in this list. And right now they're slated at number 7. So that would mean that they're automatically into the playoffs because the top 7 from each region get in. But say UND has a loss or UCM or Saginaw pick up a, a Fort Hayes, pick up a big win and somehow leapfrog them. If UND was in that 8 or 9 slot and Fort Hayes was at 7, the Greyhounds from UND would actually jump up and take that spot because of this earned access rule. Now, how do you feel about it? Eh. Eh. I don't know. I think if if your conference is not represented, that means it's not a great conference. Not to say that UND is a bad football team, because they are not. But UND lost to the number 10 team on this list in Saginaw Valley which makes me think they would not compete very well at the top at least three to four or five on this list. So, I don't know. Take that rule as you may, but that's what that earned access rule is about. But let's talk about Super Region number three. Number two, excuse me. Hello. Valdosta State atop Super Region number two now. Wingate now with the one loss in the year. And I think the, the most exciting part of this is that Wingate and Carson Newman are set to meet in a crash course collision with Carson Newman this weekend for the SAC championship. That's going to be an interesting one. You got West Alabama in there at the three spot. Lenore Ryan is back up to number five. And then you've got some good representation here from Miles and Johnson C. Smith. The CIAA has been one that's um, been much more represented in kind of these regional rankings in the past couple of years. Johnson C. Smith was 8-0. and They've dropped two games in a row. First one was the Fayetteville State that got shut out this last week. Livingstone knocks off the Golden Bulls. We'll talk about it later. But even with those two losses, their in-region record is strong. And when I uh, you know, go over, there's some other metrics that they do use as far as uh, their criteria in terms of you know what's your record uh, against teams that are over 500. What, what is this KPI index, the Kevin Paga index? I do believe it stands for. I don't have all that pulled up in front of me right now, but they have a resume still at 8-2 and two that apparently is good enough. The committee deems that they would be in at the 7 spot. Now, you got a West Florida team at number 8 that plays Valdosta State this weekend. So a win for the Argonauts on Saturday could shake up a lot for those bottom 5, 6, and 7 spots if this Argo team gets hot and gets a win there. They could certainly be a play-in type of game for that team down in Pensacola. So uh, you do have Virginia Union, Winston-Salem State kind of on the outside looking in there at 9 and 10. Johnson C. Smith, I do believe, has the head-to-head -head as far as they beat both of them during the regular season. So I don't see that becoming much of an issue. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of things could shake out here. Again, that Wingate-Carson-Newman game, I wouldn't imagine that the loser of that gets bounced from this pool. I've seen crazier. 
I absolutely have. Let's go on to Super Region number three. Ferris State still on top. The Bulldogs followed closely by GVSU and Pittsburgh State, who did have in the Bulldogs their only loss of the year back in Week 0. More MIAA representation in Central Oklahoma. Then we go down to the two top foes from the GAC. Watchtop Baptist followed closely by Harding. And you got UND there at number seven with some Fort Hayes, Central Missouri, and Saginaw Valley right now being the first three out. So, what stands to shake up here? Well, that Ferris State Grand Valley game already happened. You've got a Pittsburgh State team that did not play this last week, was dormant. A Wachita Baptist team that is going to play in the Battle of the Ravine this week with the Henderson State squad that is very hungry for a big-time win. So that certainly could shake things up and knock the Tigers out if somehow they were able to lose that, which Henderson took it last year. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility. We've seen them slip up against Southern Nazarene. So um, this Wachita Baptist team I'm certain will show up, and it'll be a very competitive game. But if they are to lose that, you could be bounced out of that five spot very quickly. There's some talented teams there at 8, 9, and 10 that would love to take that place. Now... Other than that, I don't see a whole lot of mix-ups here in, in Super Region number three, and I guess we'll have to see how that uh, you know continues to evolve. But finally, Super Region number four, Pueblo, the top dog, and certainly they've played like it. They dominated against Mines this last week, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. Augustana coming in at number two, followed by Mankato, and then Angelo State who just clinched the Lone Star Championship. They have not lost to a team in region. As you see the record there, both their losses coming to MIAA teams in the first two weeks of the season. Western Colorado, Central Washington, and Bemidji round out those final three. Sioux Falls still at number eight with three losses. I mean, you look at this last loss, a very competitive one to Augustana and their key to the city game. They're on the outside looking in. Colorado Mesa right there. And School of Mines still kind of an afterthought, but admittedly still there at number 10, the Ore Diggers hanging around, but that, that game against Pueblo was really their only chance, I do believe, to, to get back into this thing. So we'll see how it all shakes out. Again, that earned access rule is something that's very interesting at the D2 level. I'm curious to see if that, after this weekend slate of games, if that has any kind of big-time implications because I can only imagine the frustrations from a team that feels like they've rightfully earned their spot into the playoffs only to be bounced because someone else's conference is not currently represented in the pool of seven in that super region. So... Man, that would be outrageous, and I honestly don't know if I could blame said coach, players, admin, whoever um, of that team if they were, like, incredibly disgruntled, right? So we're going to move over and talk some actual game film now, though. We're going to start in the GLIAC. Ferris State hosting Saginaw Valley, two of the teams that we featured there in our Super Region 3 Top 10. I shouldn't say our. I didn't make it. In the... Super Region Top 10. They squared off this weekend in Big Rapids. Ferris State takes it 27-24. This one was all over the place. Trying to keep up with this one. I was up at Michigan Tech watching Grand Valley play the Huskies. And Saginaw Valley had a lead in this one. They actually, uh, you know, at the half, Ferris State was uh, only leading by three points, 20-17. to 17. Saginaw, at one point, had multiple, I shouldn't say one point, had multiple leads throughout the big tight end taking the ball down the down the sideline there. But uh, their offense had a lot going for them, had some good things in the special teams department. And Ferris in the second half, ultimately their defense stepped up big time, was able to generate some big plays, and was ahead 27-17. In the third quarter, Saginaw would score in the third to make it 24-27 here. But uh, in the fourth, no scores. Both defenses stepping up, but Ferris is a lot more timely in doing so. You talk about some of the special teams plays right there. How about a blocked field goal from that Saginaw front? Again, though, Trinidad Chan was this one off to Brady Rose to the right side in the end zone. He has looked... Really unstoppable Trinidad, that being under center for them. And this Ferris State defense, that front seven, continues to be a very potent group to play against Saginaw giving him fits unfortunately for the Cardinals just not enough to upend the Bulldogs even though it had some good takeaways you see one of the interceptions there through the air for this Cardinal defense uh, but again not quite enough to take off Ferris State and I think one of the more impressive feats of this Ferris State defense I mean 100 yards rushing for the Saginaw team that's you know not a lot compared to what we've seen from them throughout the course of the year but that Saginaw defense is what we've come to really expect a lot out of there's our head coach Ryan Brady that rushing at defense and that defense of a unit in general for Saginaw has been really solid Ferris State was ground and pound, 171 yards on the ground and uh, 217 through the air. So they, they did a lot of damage offensively, relatively speaking to what we've seen this Saginaw Valley team give up. Now, that amount of yards against Ferris State, typically, that would be a win. 
But um, for Ferris State, they expect a lot out of themselves, and, and rightfully so. 21 first downs to Saginaw's 13. Three sacks for Ferris State. Had a punch out on the on the fumble, but did throw that one interception. And, yeah, I mean, those are kind of the, the bigger cliff notes for this. So Ferris State holds on, and I think uh, one of the bigger notes from this is that uh, the last three weeks, the number one team in the country has been knocked off. Right, I think that's a really big point out of it. Harding gets beat by Wachita. Then you go on and Grand Valley gets beat by Ferris. And then Pittsburgh State goes and gets beat. And now Ferris was very close to being the fourth team, number one ranked consecutively, to get knocked off the top. They survive here and hang on. Ferris clinches at least a share of the GLIAC championship. They play Davenport in the first Calder City Classic, a new rivalry game next week for the outright title over here in the GLIAC. Saginaw Valley's 24 points were the most allowed by the Bulldogs all season. The team, the Ferris State team, had outscored opponents 405 to 69 since the Pittsburgh State loss. You talk about a different team from week zero to week 10. Ferris State is the shining example of that. So um, we'll go over and talk a little bit about this Angelo State Western Oregon game. And admittedly, we won't talk too much about it because we do have Kenton Allen coming on later in the show. The linebacker for the Rams will come on and discuss this game and just talk about uh, the Rams right now a little bit more in detail. But what you need to know about this one, I don't have as good of cut-up highlights from this one. This, these highlights are from Flo, and uh, I should shout out as well. Those highlights from Saginaw are from ABC 12, so I appreciate those guys putting out some good content covering small school football. But talking about this one, number 20, Angelo State goes on the road. They visit Western Oregon. They take this one 38-16, to and Angelo State are Lone Star Conference champs for the second time in three years. And this Rams team, I talked about it earlier, but they started the year 0-2. You lose to Fort Hayes State. You lose to Emporia State. Two top quality MIAA opponents. Then you turn it on when you get in a Lone Star Conference play. And it's not to say, I, I don't necessarily think this was maybe a wire-to-wire -wire victory for them. By the way, these Western Oregon uniforms, absolutely clean. Those black with the red accents are ridiculously cool. Western Oregon gets on the board first here with a field goal. And looking at this one, like I said, it wasn't necessarily a wire-to-wire -wire type of game. Uh, Angelo State taking a lot of shots through the air on this one. That was the first of many for that passing attack. They'd even things up at a field goal apiece, 3-3, three to three, and then would go on to score two touchdowns, and it was 17-3. Now, Western Oregon would fight back, though. Going into halftime, 17-13, the Rams led. Into the second half, that Rams defense stepped up. 38-16 is the final, and Angelo State that defensive front, the defensive kind of that front seven who play in the box there really stepped up, made a lot of big-time plays down the stretch. You can see they had the quarterback here for Western Oregon scrambling, and they were still able to make a lot of plays. That completion right there was one of one of many that they were able to make happen, but uh, not enough to, to upset this Rams team. And again, they take the Lone Star Conference title outright. Here's the... Uh, there's the graphic right there. Sweet graphic, by the way. Absolutely really cool. Um, but Lone Star Conference champions for the second time in three years. And 2022 was the last time this team really made a playoff push. They made it to the second round and got beat by Colorado Mines. We've got a lot of guys. I say we. I'm not affiliated. They have a lot of guys in this team that were a part of that squad, that have playoff and, and kind of that postseason experience that I think is going to be very, very important for them Moving on, they close out the year against West Texas A&M next week. Could have important seeding implications for the Rams, who are kind of middle of the road right now in the Super Region rankings. A win against the Buffaloes, excuse me, could propel them up to, I don't think they would earn themselves a home game, kind of with things are slated, but you never know. All it takes is for someone else to lose and for them to win, and they could be hosting a playoff game for the Rams. Okay, let's move over here. CIAA. Fayetteville State, Winston-Salem State, two teams that have experienced a good amount of success this season, but how did this one pan out? Shout out to WSSU Ram Life for the video. Homecoming for Winston-Salem, and they would improve to 7-3 and three on the year. It would take two overtimes, though, to make it happen. Winston-Salem State, 37-31 over Fayetteville. They got off to a decent start, but this one was incredibly back and forth. The first half saw almost no scoring. It was 10-7 Winston-Salem at halftime. And really, the majority of the scoring here happened in the fourth quarter. Two touchdowns 
or excuse me, a touchdown and field goal from both squads had things tied up at 24 apiece. In the first overtime, both teams would go on and score. And in the second one, Winston-Salem, they got the ball. They made it happen. Fayetteville, not so much. And the Rams take the win behind some pretty solid offensive performances. Three touchdowns through the air for Dalen Lee. He was 21-37 to for 200 yards on top of that. Leading rusher was... Uh, Asa Barnes, hopefully I'm not saying that one correctly, 18 carries, 73 yards, and a touchdown himself on the day. Um, some decent performances on that defensive front as well. You had five different Rams in the backfield registering sacks, a lot of different guys with PBUs, led by Dante Boulding and Jamison Alsto. Um, some big-time performances there for this Winston-Salem State squad, but uh, – there you can see some of the some of the post game celebration there. I absolutely love that. Um, looks like a really fun environment over there, and a big time win for this Rams team uh, on homecoming once again, which feels pretty sweet. Let's go over to the NSIC. We've got the key to the city game, and a game that I admittedly was not nearly as familiar with as I should be. A really cool rivalry based on the fact that these two teams are just geographically so close over there in Sioux Falls. And so uh, this one, uh, I'm going to fast forward and kind of show you the ending here of how this one panned out. Sioux Falls goes to the Hail Mary. Augie knocks it down to close things out. And then after the fact here, running over to grab the aforementioned key to the city, which again, what a cool deal. What a cool trophy. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, number zero there, Epperson. Jared Epperson has been having a phenomenal year for this Augie attack. He had a career-best 202 yards. There he is holding the key on Saturday. He scored two touchdowns in each of the last four games for the Vikings. That is playing at an incredible clip. This Augustana team, number two right now in the Super Region rankings we talked about earlier. And... Augustana, they clinch at least a share of the NSIC title. They're at Bemidji State next week. It's a big-time matchup in the NSIC. They win that. They're the outright NSIC champions. Augustana team inside a conference play has been electric the last couple of seasons in a conference that we know is very deep. I don't want that to, to be left out. This conference is incredibly deep. You look at Sioux Falls, who just gave them a great game. They have three losses on the year. The Sioux Falls team doesn't. They are damn good. Uh, but going down the performances here... Gunnar Hensley for Augie, 16-25, 271, and a touchdown through the air. We talked about Jer uh, Jared Epperson. I mean, he's been a monster. Uh, led through the air on the receiving end by Jack Fisher with six catches and 99 yards. And defensively, you had Cade Lynott with two sacks in the day and a forced fumble as well as a PBU. Hayden Wallace had an interception for that Augie defense. And Augustana, man. Seems like they are playing their best football at this time of the year, which is a great sign for this program. There are two losses, one coming to the number one FCS-ranked team at the time, South Dakota State. The next one was that shocker against MSU Moorhead in week two of the NSIC season. But uh, from there on out, they have won their next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games. And a lot of them have been tight. Some have been convincing. But they've won them all the same. So be curious to see what that Bemidji State final looks like Um this coming week in the NSIC. And you know what? Whatever it looks like, will it have any implication on, on the playoffs? Bemidji State is very much on the outside looking in. And could that be a playoff game or play in game, excuse me, for the Beavers? I don't think so. But crazier things have happened. For Augustana, you certainly want to keep that number two spot in the Super Region rankings and have the potential to host a home playoff game for Augie. That is another great incentive for them. But we'll move over. I should say we should move back to the CIAA, Virginia Union at Virginia State. And this one is, is interesting for a couple reasons here. As I try and I'm stalling right now. I wait for this, ad, for this ad to finish playing so that I can actually play the highlights for you guys. Um, but this one is interesting, like I said, for maybe a couple different reasons, actually. And the first of which... Excuse me, shout out to uh, ABC8 for the highlights here of this one. The first of which is reason, uh, interesting is that we get a rematch next week in the CIAA Championship in Salem, Virginia. But in this game, before we get talking about CIAA Championship, Virginia State, the Trojans take this one 35-28, a very highly contested type of rivalry type matchup for these two teams. Virginia Union had a really strong offense, both on the ground and in the air coming into this one. And Virginia State, we knew what to expect from them. The last time the Trojans and the Panthers met in the postseason was in 1993. So um, not as to say that... Uh, I believe it was at the postseason or the championship, one of the two. But uh, let's just say these teams have not played 
quote unquote, a lot of meaningful football against each other in, in maybe a while when it came to the postseason type implications. We are going to get a rematch here, though, between the Trojans and the Panthers, which I, for one, am excited about. But you look at some of the individual performances from this one, excuse me. Um, Virginia Union, Jada Byers. We talked, I mean, we talk about Virginia Union. He's the one face that kind of comes up all the time. He got his in this one 29 carries. But 106 yards on 29 carries for Jada Byers is damn near shut down for this Trojan defense. And that is a really, really positive point and a great reason why they probably took this one out. Now, uh, Romello Williams for VSU, he had, was 14 for 23, 294, three touchdowns, did have an interception through the air. Uh, Jamil Williams, 22 carries, 100 yards, or 88 yards in net yards, I should say, and a touchdown. But... Uh, Malik Hunter, I think, was one of the, the heroes of this one. Six catches, 197 yards, and a touchdown, that being a 91-yarder. Whoa. That helps the stat book a lot. Defensively, K.J. McNeil for that Virginia State squad had one of the takeaways through the air, and then Lev Levante Gator, excuse me, had a second one with De Deshaun Coleman picking up the third interception of the day. Three takeaways for that Trojan defense for Virginia State. That was probably the biggest point that uh, they made in order to pick up that win. Back over in Super Region number four. And it's number six, Colorado State Pueblo taking on number 21, Colorado Mines. Highlights courtesy of KKTV11. Shout out to them as I'll pull those up in just a second. I love, I probably should pay for like YouTube premium at this point. But who knows if I'll ever get there. Um, but the Thunderwolves playing host to the Ore Diggers in this one. They got a lot of snow over there in Pueblo. The, thankfully, the grounds crew able to get the snow off the field and get this one underway. A forced fumble here early on for Pueblo. And that was kind of the start of the end for this Mines team. Pueblo goes on to roll 28-13 to over Mines. And this is really statement win for this Pueblo team of changing the tide. Maybe the passing of a torch, so to speak, over there on the Armac. This snaps a five-game losing skid against the Ore Diggers for this Thunderwolf squad. They claim at least a share of the Armac title and close out this weekend at Shadron State, which has been playing some decent ball. So it's not a gimme, but you would expect the pack to continue their success. Speaking of the pack, they extend its Armac win streak. To 15 consecutive games, CSU Pueblo has won inside, excuse me, of the conference. That is incredible. That really is. And again, I'd be remiss. You talk about Pueblo, you have to talk about Reggie Retzlaff. Seven catches, 139 yards, two touchdowns, both of them in the second half. And he's a guy that shows up exactly when you need him to if you're a, if you're a Pueblo fan here. On the ground, Pueblo did not have too much going for them. Um, but through the air, Roman Fuller, 25-34, 270, and three touchdowns. No giveaways through the air. The Pueblo defense also able to generate two turnovers, interceptions against the backup quarterback for Mines, but still a talented offense. I don't want to take anything away from this Pueblo defense. Peyton Shaw and Daniel Bone, who we talked about the latter of those guys quite a bit, um, were two pieces there on that defensive front. But the interceptions coming from Caden Rollo and Eli Pittman. Two takeaways through the air. Uh, Gary Seidenberger with two sacks on the day. Rolo had another one to add, along with Cody Ramming and uh, Micaiah Scipio. Two sacks as well, as long as uh, as well as a forced fumble. So it feels like again, the CSU Pueblo team is playing a multifaceted football, playing well in all three stages, which is dangerous. They're also getting hot at the right time. And it feels like inside of the RMAC, they've slayed all their demons, right? You take out a really solid Western Colorado team. You snap a five-game losing streak to a uh, Colorado School of Mines, the Ore Digger team there. Now, I mean, what's next? you got to take on Shadron State this weekend, and you're looking at hosting multiple playoff games. If you can take care of business these next couple weeks, you're going to be hosting. You'll be the number one seed in that region in SR4. And we could be saying a lot more playoff football down there in the newly renovated Thunderdome. But back to Super Region number three. The MIAA has a new champion, potentially. Um, number seven, Central Oklahoma at Washburn. And again, fast forward, they take this one 28-27 on this play. Watch, just to set the scene, Washburn setting up a field goal for the win. This is what happens 
UCO gets a hand on it. The ball doesn't even make it there. The Bronchos storm the field as time expires. They clinch a share of the MIAA title for the first time ever. Now, they joined the league, I think, in like 2008 or 2012. They haven't been around like forever. But uh, again, the first time in their team's history that they've clinched at least a portion of the MIAA title. The blocked field goal here as time expires. And that's a big-time win for this Broncho team that has just found a way to get it done against quality opponents week in and week out. The offense we know has been absolutely electric. We'll talk about them in just a second, but uh, special team steps up here. Defense steps up in a big way on the road. Emporia State coming into town next week for UCO. Again, absolutely not a gimme. An Emporia State team that is rightfully pissed off right now. Um, But let's talk about that offense for the Broncos a little bit. Two guys that have been the forefront of this offense, the quarterback and his number one target on the outside. Let's talk about Terrell Davis here for a minute as I pull up this clip. On this touchdown right here, Davis became became the single-season record holder for receiving touchdowns. That was his 13th of the year against Washburn, and that was the first score of the day there in the first quarter. One more look at it. Jet Huff. Lock and load down the right sideline. Makes two dudes miss and then puts the burners on and gets about five yards of separation before hightailing it into the end zone. Davis has been an absolute monster this year. And not to be outdone by his counterpart, later in the second quarter, this is Jet Huff, the quarterback, right here, throwing to the right side, connecting for the score. He becomes a single-season touchdown passing record holder at UCO. That was his 30th of the year for the Bronchos, a guy who, you know, just months ago had not played a game in a UCO uniform. He has come in and just set this league ablaze and has been an absolutely fantastic addition to this UCO offense. We enjoyed having him on the show. I'm excited to hopefully watch him and that potent offense continue to play further into the playoffs. So we'll see what UCL continues to do. Some more quick hitters, though, from the D2 scene. Finley takes down Northwood 27-17 at home ahead of a massive game against Tiffin next week, which definitely has some GMAC implications. Finley very much in the hunt for one of those super region number, uh, super region number two spots, I do believe. Sorry, I forgot that mixed up. I always forget what the GMAC gets thrown into there. But Finley very much in the hunt for a playoff spot. Just know that. Walsh. Upsets Ashland 24 to 10. And while that might not mean anything for Walsh, I believe they're the Cavaliers, Ashland was very much in the playoff hunt. They've played a great out of strength of schedule. They've had some big time quality wins. Uh, that is the first time that Ashland has gotten beat by Walsh in their history. And that was very much thanks to TC Mulk, 314 yards passing from him. Big day from receivers Trey Martin and Garrett Waite. Walsh, man, playing spoiler for the Ashland Eagles squad over there. How about New Haven? They defeated St. Anselm 14-11 to to once again take control of the Northeast 10 Conference. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that is because they beat Assumption as well, so they would be right up on the top there in Bentley. So, New Haven, right now sitting at that number 7 spot, would have, if the season ended today, they'd be in the playoffs. Central Missouri comes back to beat number 19 Emporia State on the road 45-36 in a game that saw almost 1,000 yards combined of total offense. UCM, though, they dominated the time of possession. Zach Zabrowski and company under center there for Central Missouri. Again, a team that has three losses but has played some really good football. I mean, if you're in Super Region 3 and you're one of those teams on the top, you would hate, absolutely hate to see UCM sneak into the playoffs the way they are playing right now. I mentioned it earlier, Livingstone, they handed Johnson C. Smith their second consecutive loss of the season, 15-10 to 10, with a depressing recap on the website. And usually, usually I don't put people on blast like this, but I thought this was worth sharing because I'm doing my research and I'm trying to check up on things. This is on the Johnson C. Smith webpage. Uh, and for those of you listening, don't worry, it'll be a quick read. A title says JCSU ends title hunt to Livingstone 1510. Here's the full recap. The Johnson C. Smith University football team falls to Living fails falls. Sorry, excuse me, I can't read. Falls to Livingstone College in the commemorative classic 1510. With the loss, the Golden Bulls fall out of the CIAA title hunt. The Golden Bulls end the regular season at eight and two. 
no how the game happened, no uh, statistical leaders, no silver lining whatsoever. And Cliff noted, footnoted right there, stats are unavailable at this time. <laughs> Man, that hurts though. I mean, your team's 8-0. and You go and lose back-to-back games, and it felt like this was the year for this Golden Bulls squad out of the CIAA. And now, you're not only are you not coming out on top, you're not even getting a chance to play for the CIAA championship. That's got to hurt. That certainly has to hurt. But uh, finally, Clark Atlanta, they're moving out of the SIC championship game after a 28-17 win over Morehouse. Rematch with Miles in the championship game, and that Miles team is one that's right up there with JCSU as far as playoff implications. So uh, that game against the Clark Atlanta team that had not won last year, my, my understanding is they are on fire this year. They, I believe, won loss in the season. Uh, I think a lot of people would be inclined to take Miles in that one, but... It would not be the first time that Clark Atlanta has gone and upset someone and surprised many others. So that's it for the D2 football talk. We got one more guest when it comes to D2. Let's get over to Kenton Allen talking about the Angelo State Rams team. Also joining the show tonight, crucial piece of an Angelo State team that just clinched a Lone Star Conference championship. Linebacker Kenton Allen. What's going on, man? Uh, it's going good. Glad to be on the show with you tonight. Dude, excited to get you on here. I was just saying that, I mean, it's... We've had some Lone Star representation, not maybe not nearly enough. Looking down there at uh, Super Region 4, man, and you guys, you've been tearing it up. A tough start to the year for you guys out of conference. You get into Lone Star play, and you just locked the hell in, apparently, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the new DC coming in, you know, everybody had their ups and downs, trying to get the groove in. Got the, the first two games. It's not the same team as it was. It's, it's yep. not the same team. We had a lot of a lot of downs, but throughout each game, being constantly improved. So we still have yet to play our best game, and hopefully, y'all can see it soon. I like that. I like that. And I mean, you talk about the time between then and now. I mean, you're talking multiple months of playing football and dozens of practices, a lot of great game experience. Some for you guys in this case, some really close wins over quality opponents. Last week was a huge one over Central Washington. This week, going all the way up to Oregon, there's uh, a lot of great things in between then and now. But uh, at the end of all of it, got to feel pretty nice to be champions of the conference. Yeah, it's uh, my first ever conference championship. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, we didn't we're just this, this close to making it to the playoffs, but this year. This conference champion is a is really a blessing for all of us because we had that chip on our shoulder, something we had to look forward to coming into the season. This is just one step to our our huge, our bigger goals over the season. Yeah, and you guys are the top scoring defense in the conference right now against some offenses that are not struggling to put up points. I mean, you look last week at a Central Washington squad that you guys hold the two scores. They went out and scored 66 and a half this week. Like, some of these numbers, like, you've done this against some really quality opponents. It's a long way of saying that what's going really well for this defensive group right now, and you talk about having someone new at the head of that, is it a lot more comfortability, people growing into their roles, a combination of all the above? Talk to me about uh, what's changed from those first couple of that rocky start to now defensively? Well, it all really started with, you know, the return of the seniors, the Eric Raskos, uh, the Jordan McKinney's, the, you know, those type of players that came in with the open mind, they got it down and they brought all the people up with them. So even they struggled at first, but as that bond grew closer in games, you know, we never panicked because like what our coach says, if he does not panic, we ain't panicking. So, Every game is you got to put our head down and work, play these great teams, and do what we have to do every single time. You play great teams, but you also have to travel a hell of a long way to do it. What the hell is it like playing a conference game in Oregon, I would be very curious to know because we, we've talked about the Lone Star uh, a good bit on the show, and even after you remove a team like uh, Simon Fraser, like some of the travel in this conference is ridiculous. Talk to me about some of the challenges of going up there to play at their field. Uh, Western Oregon, you know, it was extremely cold. <laughs> the, the the grass field is something not a lot of us have ever experienced before. Yeah. That was something different for a lot of us, but. Besides that, it was just a normal football game for us. Fair. It was just different, uh, different place, different field, but it was still football. 
over us. So yeah, how does the travel itinerary change? I'm assuming you get out there a day earlier, maybe than you're um, typically used to, and get to you know get a practice or two in on their field. How does that work? Actually, we didn't get a practice in on our field. We came in the day early, like you said. But okay, wow. Uh, we we're at the hotel. We had our walkthrough. We had an early game at one. That's something we're not used to. Yeah. So we had to wake up real early, come to the field, and get the game on. And it's two two hours behind, so the time change for a lot of people is a struggle. But I believe that too. That's a that's a big adjustment, especially talking about the kickoff time. Like that could actually be a a, a pretty big factor for sure. Hmm. Well, for me personally, coming from the JUCO, I yeah, that one hot, one o'clock games wasn't nothing new to me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was all, I can't even explain it. It was just a normal game with this <laughs> different time. I can't explain it. It was a normal game this different time. Yep. No, I, I, I feel you there. And this is a team, you know, you guys, the Rams down there, that has a history of postseason experience. And you talked about, you know, coming in last year from that JUCO for you. But does it feel like you guys still have some of that veteran playoff experience? Obviously, the, the last kind of run this team has made was in 2022, right before you got in there. Does it feel like you still have a wealth of those guys that have seen some of that postseason action? Oh, of course. M many of the yeah. players in the deep have seen that, that 2022 run. Like I said, the Eric Rasko, Jordan McKinney, the Woods, uh, Andrew oh, yeah. Pitts. Those are all great players, great leaders on our defense. Their experience is going to rub off onto the new players that came in to help this defense be as great as it is right now. Yeah, and that's kind of where I was going with that is how do you take that, you know, from those guys, you add in some big pieces like yourself who've obviously made noise on that side of the ball. How does that gel and mesh and, and you kind of build on that heading into these, what are going to be here in a couple of weeks, some of the, the biggest games of the year for you guys? Well, I can't even explain. Because, uh, you know, it's something we've done for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's is a, I guess it's just another game. I would say you don't treat it any differently, right? If you feel like you have the the oh, system yeah, down yeah. and the guys to do it, then yeah, why switch mm -hmm. it up, right? Yeah. I, I do. Yeah. I totally get where you're coming from there. Now, um, yeah. to talk about you specifically, I mean, this has been a great year for you. Fifth game this year for for ten or more tackles, my man. You've been absolutely yeah, killing you. it. What is it about the position and that system that allows you to go after the ball carrier like that and um, really fill up the stat book? Obviously. I'm sure you'll deflect and talk about, you know, the the part of, like, the team being that and getting some good results, too. But talking about yourself a little bit, man, this this position, your ability to fly around and get after the ball carrier, talk about that and how you fit into that scheme. Well, like you said, I, I want to personally shout out to my D linemen. Those four in the front oh, yeah. make it so much easier. They have to deal with those trenches a lot more than me. They make it – they clear everything up. But, you know, uh, last year I didn't uh, – I didn't get to play much, but I did play a little bit with the new DC. Mm -hmm. I, coming into the season, I wasn't I wasn't the number one guy. Yeah. The the first game, uh, the number one guy he hurt his shoulder. Uh, but then I had to step up, and that came in with that chip on my shoulder that I wasn't the number one guy. So it's time to show them why they should have made me that number one guy. Absolutely. No, I feel you there. I come into, yeah, I just had that in my back of my head that I was doubted from the beginning to be in the position I was. I wasn't supposed to be here, I feel like. And, but each game, just have to just go out, play, do something I've been doing, I love to do for a long time, and it's the results show. They absolutely do, man, especially talk about your guy that maybe has a, a quote-unquote unconventional journey of getting to this point, right? So it's just another step along the road for you, if, whether it's proving someone else wrong or maybe proving some other people right. I think that's a, a cool way of thinking about it, too. Like, you've obviously had people in your corner, whether that's coaches, teammates, family, friends, those kind of things. I think there's uh, two sides of that. You've certainly done, you've done both those things, man, and it feels like for this team – a key point of it is possessing the ball. You guys as a defense have been able to generate a ton of turnovers and a stat for you that I just read today, you've got the only quarterback in D2 football with more than 200 pass attempts that has not thrown an interception. Now I'm going to knock on everything over here, but that is a ridiculous statistic. You guys uh, on both sides of the ball have taken care of it incredibly well. How do you practice that? And, and how cr critical is that on Saturdays? 
Well, uh, each practice, well, we just practice and practice. The, the, we just make the same plays we make in the game with our with the help of our scout team. They give us the great looks. So during the game, it's just easy for us. No, well, not saying it's easy, but <laughs> it's I something we work on. So when we see it on the field, we know it's coming. And, you know, we got to get after it. And it's a lot of times it goes our way. And that's how, how I feel it happens. Great teams make their own luck, especially defensively, right? You talk about just rallying to the ball or being at a, the right place at the right time and, and the ball happens to find you or things kind of roll out the way they're supposed to be. And that's that's what happens when you got a squad that's yeah. prepared like that, for sure. Now, you guys got West Texas coming into town this weekend. What do you know about the Buffaloes that you got to try and stop defensively? Well, they have a great quarterback in a great running back room. They they they're gonna they're gonna come give us us man. We're we're, we're gonna prepare for them too. We're gonna treat them like every other team that we play. Yep. We're gonna prepare the right way, and we're, we're gonna come down. They're gonna come down, and we're gonna have a great game. So. Fair enough, my friend. I'm excited to watch you guys the rest of the way. Take care of business this weekend. And, you know, whether or not that happens, hopefully some some big-time football for you guys to be played in the next couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for spending some time with me tonight, Kentana. I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Absolutely. Have a good night, man. Okay, here to talk D3 football. Jimmy Martin. Jimmy, my friend. We are at a point where most of the automatic qualifiers have – Determine themselves, and that's. I think we're going to start this thing off, dude. There's a, a lot less uncertainty in D3 football this week, huh? Yeah. No, there's some huge games this week. I'm excited to talk about them. There are. We'll definitely get to that. Let's start with every D3 team in the playoffs as of right now, and that's determining as, uh, you know, you win your conference, obviously you get the automatic bid into the tournament, starting with Randolph-Macon, who for the third time consecutively, the three years in a row, they have clinched and are into the playoffs. Northwestern, a team that I do believe is their first time in their program's history clinching the bid going into the playoffs. And then you go to North Central, who's no stranger to this type of stage. John Hopkins very much in the same boat there. Susquehanna, who has played some really competitive football, gave Cortland a scare earlier on in the season, was the only team to beat them last year. Endicott team, the goals, we've seen them play a really strong out-of-conference schedule. They are in UMass Dartmouth, a team that I think on this show, maybe we need to start talking about a little bit more. They've got an offense over there and a, a quarterback that have been playing pretty lights out. And then you go down to Lake Forest, who's had some really good defensive battles and some big pieces on that side of the ball. They've clinched an automatic bid. Also, Wartburg back in the national scene, no surprise there. Cortland, who we had Zach Boys on the episode earlier talking about the Red Dragons. Hobart is in as well. And continue to go down. The Spartans from Aurora and Illinois back in the dance. Maryville, the Scots, again, a team that I don't think we've talked about maybe too much on this show. And... Harden Simmons, we'll talk about them later on in, in this episode. Another big win over UMHB this past week. Hope out of the MIAA, not Alma this year. The, a uh, Dutchman, I do believe, take the conference. And then Salisbury, who is the new number one in terms of NPI. Did you see that? I did, yeah. Big time for the goals. And finally, Kings College, we talked about last week with their big win over Delaware Valley. They take the MAC conference. And with that, the automatic bid into the playoffs. Last but not least, the Purple Raiders from Mount Union. We'll talk about them as well, getting the job done no against there. Marietta. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of these, not any big, crazy surprises. Um, Hope getting into it and taking out Alma, I, I don't think was on our bingo card at the start of the season. Anything else jump out to you about these uh, 18 squads? Uh, I mean, not, not necessarily. I mean, I was obviously surprised, you know, seeing uh, – oh, jeez. Who was I blinking out on? There was one team we just talked about how they, they had gotten in like three years in a row. and Randolph? You know, right yeah, uh, no, not Randolph making Someone missed – yeah, Alma. That was obviously one. Okay. Of, yeah, but that was the one I was thinking of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, I mean, those teams are all in – as of as of now, and there's a lot more teams that are going to be cementing their spot as well. But let's start with one of those teams that we know is is going to be in the dance in Cortland and our game of the week selection for I think a lot of reasons. This uh, 
this Cortland squad, man, I mean, we talked about it with Zach earlier on, or at least I did. Um, they're down 14 nothing to start. And, and that's, you know, that's happened once this year. That was against Susquehanna. The Riverhawks got ahead of the Red Dragons, but that's not a place they've found themselves at very often. So they're able to bounce back. And even though they only score 29, almost 600 yards of total offense, talk about your takeaways from this one for Cortland and Brockport in some respect. Yeah, so obviously, they're, like you said, their only lead of the game came on the game-winning field goal with 27 seconds left. Uh, just crazy one here. Uh, obviously, Brockport, pretty solid team. I was not expecting them to keep it this close necessarily, but obviously being at home, we had a little bit of home field advantage, but uh, obviously huge win for Cortland clinching the uh, playoff bird. That is huge. Now you're talking about a, a Brockport team that – has two losses, and that game was for the Empire 8 Conference. So if Brockport takes that, you know, they would have the automatic bid because they were also undefeated in conference play heading into that game. The two losses for Brockport, one-point loss to the defending national champions in Cortland and a six-point loss to then number 11 team in the country, Susquehanna. Yeah, I mean, they're giving themselves a chance for an at-large bid. I mean, they win this week. You see that 8-2, and two, like... That's what's crazy, though, is they're, they might yeah. still be on the outside looking in. And they play Alfred uh, this weekend, Alfred University, on the road. But it, it's like it's to the point where even if they win, they are not a lock for one of those at-large bids, which is yeah. scary. And there's a lot of teams that are really, really good that may not get an at-large bid, as we'll probably talk about a little bit later, too. But yes, a lot of really no. good football teams in Division Three. A lot of good teams. Yes, I'm 100%. Uh, agree with you there and that's I think that was just kind of my big takeaway from that is like Brockport has put together this uh, a really solid season their defense has been one of the best scoring defenses in the country statistically speaking and that's been the last couple seasons they really gave Cortland a, a run for their money there just a little bit coming up short on Saturday and um, a game that certainly did not disappoint as well that's Mount Union taking on Marietta for what would be the OAC championship and Kudos to WKBN27 for this tape that we're uh, about to roll on the show here. Mount Union gets it done, but not incredibly convincingly. 28-21, the Purple Raiders get the job done, Jim. So, a uh, little fun fact. There were 4,900 4, people at this ballgame, and they saw a miraculous Mount Union comeback. Yeah. Two touchdowns in the last five minutes of the game. The game winner coming from Tyrell Sanders with a 32-yard touchdown reception. Oh, man, it's just so tough for Marietta. It's just brutal. They had him on the ropes, and they just couldn't finish, obviously. Uh, Mount Union had a very, very healthy balance of uh, running and passing attack, averaging 5.6 yards per carry on the ground. Uh, they had a dual quarterback system. We won uh, 19 for 31, 243 yards, two touchdowns, so very efficient. Sitting at about a 60% clip and uh, completion percentage. Um, but, man, oh, man, Marietta's got to be bummed. You know, they were ranked coming into this one and going on the road at Mount Union and being up late, and they just – Oh, man. It hurts. Brutal. If you're on the wrong side of it, right? It hurts if you're on the wrong side of it. And I think um, the big highlight play that just played a couple times right there, Tyrell Sanders with that one foot in over the shoulder, which a great ball by all accounts as well. The pass was incredible, but you saw the one foot tap in right on the side of the end zone. That is, uh, I mean, quality type catch. Like That was ridiculous. Uh, And it came at a very critical part of, of the game, too. That is the fourth quarter. 32 seconds left. Things are tied up at 21. You make a play like that to propel your team to a conference championship. And um, I, I think people knew this game was going to be competitive. Did they think it would be tied with 30 seconds left in the fourth quarter? I would I would argue no. No. No, I know I didn't. Uh, but, hey, like we said, any given Saturday, anyone can go in there and win a game. So you got to come in with a good game plan, especially in the, the rivalry, conference rivalry like that. You know, you got to have your you got to have your A game. Yeah, Marietta, uh, very efficient on offense as well. Uh, Connor Vierstra, 26-38, 266, and two touchdowns through the air. That ran for a combined total over 100 yards on the ground, so definitely had some success. Dawson Snyder led him receiving 12 catches for him on the day, 103 yards and a tud. And, um, again, the Marietta team that it's like, now what? You know what I mean? It's uh, it's it's really hard to, to tell, I guess. And you look at what they have right now. Very similar in that they're eight and one, obviously undefeated up until this point. They close out the year at John Carroll, who maybe hasn't had the year that we've expected them to have. But uh, you win that at nine and one again. You would imagine there's a really good chance they're at large, but it all comes down to those NPI rankings. And I, admittedly, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly where they sit. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know five teams with a really tough schedule with some big non-conference wins. You know, a team like Oshkosh will benefit from the NPI for sure, even though they have their third loss now. Yeah. Um, they, they have to win in order to get in next week. But, um, you know, that's what – loading up your schedule early in the year, getting a couple big wins can be huge for you down the stretch if you drop a conference game or two. Yep, 100%. And as, I, as we talk about it, I was going to pull up – here are the uh, the latest NPI rankings, just so we can look at that. As I was referencing it, we may as well take a peek at them right here. And uh, in that top spot is Salisbury, and then you go down the list, and Hardin-Simmons, St. John's, North Central, and Cortland all up there. Mount Union and at that number six spot right now. Hope all the way at number seven through this metric, which is just... Demanzo, stand up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, uh, which is awesome. Um, but then you got on that list, Marietta, not featured on this, and uh, Brockport, not either. Now, you do look at this list, and there's a lot of the 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 people on this list are, are teams on this list, I should say, are a lot of those automatic qualifier type deals. So it's not like they're going to be stealing a lot of the at-large. But there are quite a few teams on here that are not or have not at least clinched their conferences. So those at-large spots are going to go immediately um, very fast, and they're going to be uh, very competitive and very highly sought after. But we'll keep things going. The second time these two teams have met this year, Harden-Simmons playing host this time to Mary Harden-Baylor. The Cowboys get the job done. They pull off the sweep on the season, Jimmy. Yeah, they're uh, throwing brooms around after that one. That's what I, that's what I heard. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> no, Harden-Simmons keeps their undefeated season attack with a major, major victory over a very – formidable rival in Mary Hart and Baylor. Uh, really efficient on third down. This was the stat I kind of noticed. They were 8 for 17 on third down, which is pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. Uh, yep. Right, Mary Hart and Baylor didn't go down without a fight. They were down pretty big early, but uh, two four-quarter touchdowns and two two-point conversions made it a little bit closer than it looked. But uh, obviously, no moral victories at this point in the season. You had to have that one, and they came up a little short. But uh, and Mary Hart and Baylor had some good wins. They needed to beat Whitewater. You know, they've... Uh, been a solid year, but obviously you lose two you lose two games to Harden Simmons is just gonna demoralize the locker room, which just kind of sucks. Yeah, I mean you look at the second quarter, Harden Simmons scores 20 points. And now you go from a three-nothing first quarter to now Harden Simmons, they're up 17 to three. They hit a field goal literally to end the half. Now it's 20 to three. And you talk about I think a lot of teams, I should say, talk about winning those last couple minutes before the half and then coming out of the half. Those are big momentum swing type moments in a game like this. Harden Simmons hits a field goal as time expires to end the first half. And then into the third quarter, they score and they strike first and draw blood at a seven yard touchdown run from Derek Roberson. Roberson excuse me. Um, then it's 27 3. And like you said, there was still some fight, two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. It's just not enough. It, if nothing else, it made the score look a little bit more interesting. But other than that, it wasn't really anything to write home about. Second straight year that Harden Simmons takes the ASC. So shout out to uh, the Cowboys down there. We'll see what they can stir up when it comes to playoff football. But uh, a team that has been, for lack of a better term, stirring up a lot of shit, Jimmy. That's you guys down there. Talk to me about this weekend. Stout taking on number nine, UW Oshkosh. And I will, uh, I will just leave it at that. Oh, man. So, obviously, you got Luke Cool, the best kicker in America. The guy just delivers game after game after game. I mean, this guy's got ice in his veins. I mean, his last name is very fitting for his persona around the locker room. Uh, our Division Three Special Teams Player of the Week, six for six and extra points, and they nailed the game-winning field goal with just two seconds left. It's from 24 yards, but it does not matter. When, it, when it's a game-winning kick, it's a game-winning kick. You're going to get Player of the Week. That's freaking awesome. Yep, there you go. Um, on another note, uh, Adam Moen, by the way, the quarterback for Stout, has been absolutely playing out of his mind. Another five touchdown performance this week. From week one to now, he's a completely different quarterback. Uh, getting through his reads, progressions, running the ball really effectively as well. And uh, Luke Sedin actually got in there, made a big run for us, got us into a better scoring position, gave Moen a breather. Well, that was huge. But uh, the WIAC just continues to be an enigma. Like No one knows like who's the top dog. And like we still don't know if – you're going into week 10 here. It's week 11. But there could be a four-way tie, depending on how everything goes down. And that would just be absolute chaos for the mm -hmm. playoff. It would. And now you have a lot in stake, at stake Excuse me, this weekend. But I mean, you guys start 
pretty hot, all things considered. You tie it up at seven, you take the lead, and then this really was back and forth, but you guys start to really separate, you know, going, again, we talk about ending the second half and going into that, or ending the first half, excuse me, going into that second half. You score um, into the second, or near the end of this, uh, the second quarter, talked about Moen coming on the eight-yard run, that's 28-14. Then you score again, 35-14. Uh, Tucker catches that one, and... The game could have gotten away there. Oshkosh finds a way to tie it up. Trey Tetzlaff, six and a half minutes left to tie things up at 42. And then, of course, the man on the screen, Luke Cool, he gets the job done for you guys. I mean, talk about the uh, the environment there. Road Warriors. Yeah. You know, it came out with a big one. And uh, there's a lot of controversial calls late in the game, too, that made it a little bit closer. Like we, had a, we had a kickoff return. Like, Pat Corcoran was like, clearly down on the ground, and they ruled it a fumble. And that made it. I mean, we're, if we just get the ball there, get a couple first downs, it's over, and then they get the ball back from that fumble, and then obviously they go down, we tie, they tie it, and then they miss a field goal. They could have taken the lead, and then we go down and get the field goal, and that was it. So it was, it was, it was surreal. It was, awesome. it was awesome. I believe it, dude. I believe it. So now, um, you know, moving forward, you guys, Platteville this weekend, and, and you mentioned it. I mean, you win, and it seems like all signs point towards you guys get the automatic qualifier and the bid out of the WIAC, which, again, you talk about being on the freaking bingo card. Not a person. That's no shot at you guys. Not a person in America had that on the bingo card at the start of the year, and that's why the sport is so special. Now, I will mention, though, in the summer, when you asked who I thought would win the WIAC, I said it's going to be someone that no one expects. You did. And I think you know who I was thinking of, but I did not say <laughs> yeah. it. You know, because you, you got to be humble on the show, obviously. But we, we've all believed all year that we are capable of doing whatever we want to do. I mean, it's up to us. And uh, I did see that Plattville posted that they clinched on their Instagram, which was kind of interesting because now, I don't know if they've actually clinched. Maybe they, they have clinched that uh, they have at but, least a share of the yeah. whacked, which is correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is true. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I got to. I don't know. I, but you from your perspective, I mean, I'm sure you guys take it as, yeah. you know, you take it as a chip, right? Add the exactly. chip to the shoulder, no, right? I Absolutely. Like, I was like, what's that? Like, what do you, what do you mean? But no, I mean. I do, I do get that perspective yeah. a lot. And I think the cool thing about it, you know, for you guys is you get to control your own destiny. And at this point in the season, there are not a lot of teams that say that. So now you guys get to control uh, your destiny when it comes to the playoff football. And that's really exciting. Now, these two teams talk about over in the WIAC. Not so much the case. Whitewater at number 20, UW Lacrosse. Shout out to WXOW19 for the tape. Lacrosse, Jimmy, the Eagles take it 24 21 in this one. No, there are a lot of questions about Lacrosse after they fell to two and three early in the year, and all those questions were put to rest after this four game win streak for the Eagles with some pretty signature wins, obviously being at Stout and then taking down Whitewater. Um, you know, this one was interesting because. Early in the year, we're like, oh, this is the WIAC championship game, da-da-da. And this was more like, oh, whoever loses, their season's over. Yeah. So it was a very big dynamic switch in, uh, in this game, obviously. But uh, no, lacrosse coming out on top, they're they're really good uh, late in the game. Obviously, early in the year, they had some struggles finishing games, but they've been really good these last couple of weeks, especially uh, making big plays late. And we saw that this week as well. Absolutely, dude. Like you said, I mean, you look at the start of the year preseason-wise, you would probably would have uh, marked this one, put a star on it for that WIAC championship, and now it's like, who's playing in the Isthmus Bowl? You know what yeah. I mean? The, the stakes have yeah. certainly changed, and these two teams still have picked up some quality wins along the way, but it's just not to the same caliber. Maybe it just sounds wrong, but it's not to the same level of that. You know, the stakes are not quite, quite as high as, as maybe we expected, and this, this conference has taken a turn for – who knows what? Um, what do you think of these all black unis from lacrosse? By the way, there's our there's our friend Studer just ripping down the sideline as I say that. They're pretty cool. I like yeah. them. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm a fan. I, I can say as someone not affiliated no, they're, that they're, they're bad sweet. ass. They're the sweet, chrome dude. helmet is sick. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool. You gotta give credit where credit is due, even if they're your conference rival. <laughs> uh, I love that. But yeah, I mean, this is uh, you had mentioned like this is a. Uh, Kind of an exclamation point for this lacrosse squad. And defensively, offensively, they get it done. You talk about right here getting back to the quarterback. We've seen a lot of the offensive highlights. And um, this team where maybe they would have liked to have seen some of this play a little earlier in the season, very much still getting a lot of that done. Now, two games I had Cliff noted here at the end. Um, in the pack, Grove City takes down Case Western Reserve 30-20. to They hold the Spartans to only 21 yards rushing on the day. That seemed like a ridiculous stats, especially yeah. since they still scored 20 points. 
Um, finally, the one that was brought to attention on Instagram. Uh, thank you, someone, for bringing this to my attention. Carlton College, they beat Gustavus for the first time since 1996. And they didn't just do it by one point, 51 to 17 behind seven touchdowns from quarterback Jack Curtis. You know, they opened up a can of whoop ass in that when I started. <laughs> doing it. I, it up. Yeah, I don't know if you got that at first, but no, I had to specify what I was doing there. But uh, no, a signature win for Carlton. Obviously, you can say it's a pretty solid program. We we uh, didn't play them this year. We played them the last two seasons. And they're, That's right. They're, they're always tough. Man. They're always tough. So definitely an eye popper. I did not expect to see that score for sure. No. Like you said, that is that is might be multiple cans, um, all open up at the same time. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> those feel like the uh, the biggest points from D three this week. I mean, literally, you think about it. A week from now, we are going to have clarity. We're going to have a playoff field for D three football, and then hopefully, we'll be talking about going and doing a show somewhere. But uh, whether or not you're involved in that is still up in the air because we might still play be playing some meaningful football down there at Stout. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Sweet, dude. This is exciting. Hopefully There's a lot of cool stuff going on. So, <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. But be sweet. hell yeah. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate yeah. it, dude. Only gets better from here on out, my friend. Yes, sir. We're gonna close things off here with some NAI coverage. No match wars tonight. He's tied up with his uh, his real job, his big boy job. So get over it. You're stuck with me. Let's start things off with our game of the week selection. Northwestern College traveling over to Dort and. This is a pretty monumental game. Northwestern heading into this one, the all-time series, 18 wins and zero losses against the defenders. They've never taken down Northwestern. It felt like this year, Dort, the year they've been having a little bit of the down that Northwestern has been on, relatively speaking, to their usual success that we've become accustomed to. This was the window for Dort to really go and make something happen. When you uh, turn on the tape here, it was very much a defensive battle. The final in this one, three to nothing. Northwestern wins this, and uh, like I talked about, it's not exactly an offensive explosion from either of these squads, and when it comes down to it, Northwestern had uh, the one field goal in the third quarter off the leg of Eli Stater. I hope we're pronouncing that one correctly. Some other big plays, I mean, you see a takeaway right here from that Red Raider defense that certainly stopped the Dort drive. Um, there were a couple of those throughout the day that were very critical at certain points of the game, but it was the end of the game. Here's the one score, by the way. I do believe, off the foot of Stater, there it is. That would be the only points scored in this one for Northwestern or any team. Um, a couple of different attempts from this Dort squad, that one being the finisher blocked. Northwestern gets through, gets a hand on the ball, and closes this one out for the road win 3 to nothing over Dort. And for this defender team, talk about a demoralizing defeat Right, I mean, this is feels like, again, your window to potentially go and finally make something happen against a team in the G-Pack that has just terrorized you for years. And uh, Northwestern still finds a way to get the job done. I mean, that is just... That's a tough thing to swallow there. For Northwestern, Hayden Grews under center, 12 or 23, 78 yards, not exactly finding much through the air. Colson Cruz for uh, Dort was a little bit better off, 12 of 18 with 125 yards, but the two interceptions, one of which we saw on the tape there, those were big for that Northwestern defense. They had a little bit more success running the ball than Northwestern did, but still only amounted to just over 100 yards on the ground. Dort much in the same. Not a lot of uh, big games from receivers, but on the defensive side, that's where things uh, really got interesting. Uh, ben Elgi for Northwestern had one pick, and the other one came from Cole Tefford. And there were a couple of guys that had some other big-time performances, a couple of sacks from Tristan Voss. Parker Fryer, who we have talked about a little bit on this show, he's had some National Player of the Week honors. Tallied 12 tackles at a TFL. That was the sack in the backfield. Uh, a lot of different guys getting into the backfield for this Northwestern defense. I mean, 10 different players registering some kind of TFLs. That is... That's a pretty incredible stat right there. And Stater was one for three on the day, the kicker for Northwestern. He hit the one from 38, missed from 48, and from 40 in the second and the fourth quarter, respectively. The last one to close things off was Steven Linen in the fourth quarter. There were 17 seconds left from 41 yards. That was the kick that you saw that got blocked. So that was our game of the week selection simply because of that. I mean, it was a defensive struggle and it came down to literally the last 17 seconds of the game. A block field goal seals the deal, gives the Red Raiders the win. And for this Northwestern team, probably not talking about, I mean, I don't even know. The NAIA scene, they moved to 7-2 and two on the year. Their two losses being uh, both in conference, one to Concordia and the other to Morningside. 
and you know, you're obviously not going to win the conference. They close out the season next week against Briar Cliff, but then what does the at large look like for the AIA field? Are they going to be a shoe in? I, I don't really think so, but uh, I think it's safe to say their season's not a hundred percent over with and you know correct me if I'm wrong there but we'll move forward and talk about a couple other games that honestly could have all been the game of the week type selection for this week uh, the one that we'll move forward to next though we're going to talk about the Georgetown Tigers the back-to-back Mid-South Conference champions down there in Georgetown they took on Campbellsville a team that has been incredibly hot to start the year they dropped one a few weeks ago, I do believe, and uh, this one goes into overtime. 24-17, Georgetown takes this one over the Tigers. They score in overtime and shut down Campbellsville in the extra time there. And this one was, I mean, from the looks of things, immediately I didn't get to watch, but pretty back and forth. 17-3 uh, lead for Georgetown. Campbellsville ends up tying it up in the fourth quarter at 17. That would go into overtime until uh, Sluniker finishes things off, punching it in with a one-yard run, and you look at these, uh, the box score here and some of the the numbers, these teams seemed like they were pretty matched up as far as, like, not one team really jumped out here. Um, when you do look at what they were able to do through the air, Campbellsville, a much more air-priority attack, threw the ball 41 times, completed 24 of them, uh, but, uh, you know, got, got it done defensively as well, four sacks on the day, and... Another big-time win for this Georgetown team who dominated the time of possession, 48 minutes to 26. And, yes, that's a very lopsided number. Remember, they went to overtime, so the number is a little bit inflated right there. Uh, but, again, another big win for this Georgetown squad. You look at them right now in conference, obviously, are the, the ones on top. And on the year, they have two losses. But, remember, the first one is their home – or not home opener, but their season opener at Montana Tech – which they lost by one score. And then you lose to a Division I opponent, Alabama A&M. So those are your two losses. Once you get into the actual Mid-South play, they have not lost, and they've beaten some really quality teams along the way. You talk about Reinhardt, Cumberland, Bethel, uh, Cumberlands, plural. Now, you got to close out the year at Lindsey Wilson, but uh, like we said, the conference is already all buttoned up for this Tiger team, so they will be playing some extra football here into the playoffs. And uh, the Tigers, you talk about that schedule, all the quality opponents they've played. They've played in seven games now that have been decided by eight points or less. That is a mark of a really good team and, and one that I think this Georgetown team is carrying very well. Darius Neal, he made school history again by uh, surpassing the 3,000 career rushing yards mark, making him the third Tiger to ever accomplish the feat in program history. Shout out to Darius Neal. That is a, that is a big-time number right there, 3,000 yards. Very impressive. The next one we'll talk about, though, over in the KCAC, back in the Kessinger, We've talked a lot about this the last couple weeks for good reason. This one was a ridiculous game as well. Friends University travels over to McPherson. 36-35, to the Falcons take this one. And, I mean, holy shit, this division of the KCAC has been ridiculous. Friends, of course, we talked about just a couple weeks ago, gets handed their first loss of the season to an Evangel team that we thought maybe was primed to go and win it all. Evangel just got thumped by Southwestern, and this KCAC is all over the place, especially the Kessinger side of it towards the end of the season. McPherson, of course, has been showing a lot of promise as well, and now when you look forward here, I believe now that Although we have three one-loss teams in the Kessinger, that uh, Friends does have the head-to-head -head over the other two. And I'm going to double-check that right now. Yeah, so Friends is tied with McPherson and Southwestern at 3-1 and one inside of the division. But they hold the tiebreaker due to the head-to-head -head win over both of those teams. So now they close out the year next week at Bethany College, which by all accounts Friends is very much expected to win. Kickoff set for, for 1 o'clock. If they win, they win the Kessinger division of the KCAC, and they clinch the program's first playoff berth since 2008. For a Friends team that has been a really feel-good story, you talk about Kevante Baker, the quarterback for them, coming back to play for his high school coach, who he had stepped away from the game, had a kid during that time, and um, I think a big part of his reason, there's a great feature story put out about him, about, um, you know, wanting to show up and, and show out and still continue to do the things he loved for a guy that he really enjoyed playing for. There's a lot... More to the story than that, but just giving you the cliff notes, this friend squad feels like a really good, feel-good story combined with the fact that they're a very good football team. So, friends very much poised to take over the Kessinger and get that playoff bid. But, 
finally here on some of the games that we'll do a deep dive on. And again, no Matt, so I apologize for maybe the lack of uh, in-depth commentary as I, I do my best here. We will go out to the frontier as we typically do. And you hear a part of the highlights already. I apologize. How about Carroll visiting Montana Western? Carroll, up to this point in the season, absolutely flawless inside of Frontier Conference play. They would go play the Bulldogs. That would last no longer. Montana Western takes this one 27-14. And UMW's defense held Carroll to 167 yards of total offense. That is is an incredible stat. 36 of those yards coming on the ground. You talk about a Carroll team that has been perfect inside a conference play this year. They go on the road and only get 36 rushing yards against the top-ranked defense, and they were able to get some damage done through the air. You see it there. Um, Jack Perk on the end zone to bring Carroll ahead, 14-13. They're still in the first half, I do believe. And, again, this was a gritty game. I don't want to make it seem like Montana Western absolutely dominated, but they scored in every quarter. And I uh, know that was in the fourth quarter, excuse me, where that, that last touchdown, I do believe. Yes. Um, so the fourth quarter, they would score. That was Perk on the 22-yard pass from Carson Ocho. Hopefully pronouncing that one correctly. But then Montana would add two scores of their own uh, in the fourth, one with 10 minutes to go, and then uh, last one there with just 50 seconds to go, a Pete Gibson 10-yard touchdown run, and that gives the Bulldogs the victory. So uh, definitely a big-time performance from that Montana Western squad who has shown up and showed out for multiple points throughout the season. They do have the one loss in the record that, if I am correct, came to Southern Oregon earlier in the year. Yes, it did. Their second game of uh, the Frontier Conference play, they lost by two to that Southern Oregon squad. So now, if you look at the Frontier Conference right now and the way that the conference is kind of shaking out, right now at the top is Montana Western with an overall record of 8-1, and 6-1 one, and one inside a conference play. Montana Western and Carroll both 6-1, and one, but obviously because of this result, Montana Western holds the head-to-head -head advantage and... Right now, it's Montana Western's conference to lose. I mean, you look at what they've been able to do, and even with that one blemish earlier in the season, you close out the year at Eastern Oregon next week. That is absolutely not a gimme, but they take care of business there. They will clinch and make it back into the playoffs. Otherwise, some other notes across the country in NAIA. Bethel, Tennessee, to go back uh, over to the KCAC. They go into Lindsey Wilson. They win 33-31 in not one, not two, not three, but four overtimes. Bethel and Lindsey Wilson, that was a shootout. And one of the candidates for Game of the Week. Um, but just, we thought we'd give the nod to the GPAC foes over there. Southern Oregon, going back to the frontier, they win the in-state contest versus Eastern Oregon, 49-21, and a really strong showing. Kaiser keeps things rolling against in-state opponent Florida Memorial, 51-16. That offense and offensive backfield look really powerful against the, 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 against the Lions down there. Southwestern, they dominated at Evangel. We go back to that. 21-3 uh, against an Evangel team that we've been really high on and, and really surprised to see that result. Finally, we had Colcon last week, St. Francis, Indiana. They go and defeat St. Xavier at home 27-14 to continue adding to this resume that the Cougars have built throughout the course of this year. But a lot of great NAI football, NAI football, excuse me, to be decided the coming weeks. We have a couple Bertus that have already been clinched. We talk about Georgetown being one of them down there in the Mid-South. But um, still a lot on the line and a lot of things to shake out in this NAI playoff picture. So we'll see what kind of parody and chaos is brought this coming week. But thank you very much for tuning into the show. For D1 Rejects, I've been Kobe Manzo.